Now that we've overviewed the general notation and what the receiver structure looks like, let's go ahead and start doing the real analysis for the distributions of these different quantities. So we want to understand statistically how U0 behaves, how V0 behaves, U1 and V1 under different circumstances. First circumstance is how do these look statistically when you send me signal 0? And then the other case is how do these quantities look statistically when you send me S1. So that's what we want to analyze now. To derive the characteristics of these quantities, we're going to make some assumptions. These are very similar to the assumptions we always make. First of all, the baseband quantities, MIFT, WIFT, and the theta, these are what embed information. We're going to assume that their variation, and or their bandwidth respectively, is very small relative to the carrier. Okay, so that's one thing we're going to assume that these baseband information quantities, the way that they change as a function of time is very small relative to our carrier frequency. Another thing we're going to assume is that anytime we get a double frequency component, so a lot of times when we do the math, we get this cosine squared. We use a trig identity to turn a cosine squared into a one half plus cosine at double the frequency, and then that double term gets integrated. We're assuming anytime that we run into that, that that is either um, zero or negligible. We can restrict the carrier frequency to make it exactly zero, but even if we don't do that, typically that integral is still very small. So in general, we're just going to assume that it's zero. We're going to assume that W0 times cosine and W1 times cosine are orthogonal. So anytime we get kind of cross terms, even if it's cosine times a cosine, that these W0 times W1 ends up giving us orthogonality regardless of the value of phi and psi. And then finally we're going to assume that these two quantities are also orthogonal whenever i is not equal to j. Okay, so lots of just kind of upfront assumptions such that when we encounter these terms we know how to handle them and you can go through and uh, reason why these are reasonable assumptions. So like everything else in this course, to do this analysis now, we're going to assume a case, and the case that we're going to start with is that the signal S0 was sent. So under the assumption that S0 was sent, so given S0, we want to, want to understand the decision statistic U sub i. So if S0 was actually sent, then the received signal is going to have this form. It's going to be S0 of t plus noise. And we know that we can write our decision statistic U sub i in this form. There's basically two pieces. There's the deterministic part due to the signal coming through the, the system and being integrated and then there's also the random part due to the noise coming through the system and being integrated. So S0 of t comes through our linear system to yield ui and this comes through our system to yield x sub i. So we basically break the analysis down now into two pieces. Let's understand the deterministic part. Let's understand the random part. The deterministic part is pretty easy, it's just a write down. If we go back to our block diagram and we go back to the form of our signals, we can actually write down what that product is when we mix the S0 of t with the top branch of our receiver structure. If you go back and write that down, the general equation that you get is this integral right here. Okay, So we integrate this quantity Similarly, for the noise part, if you go back to the block diagram, noise comes in, and then that noise gets mixed on that top branch with square root 2 wi cosine. Okay, So it gets mixed with that. You might wonder why there's a of i here. What we're doing is we're really working on both cosine parts of the receiver at the same time. In our receiver structure, there's four branches. Two of them have a cosine, two of them have a sine. The two that have a cosine, the only difference between them is the there's a w0 and theta0 and a w1 and theta1. So what we've done here is we re replace that subscript with i, and we're going to work the math here in general for i, and then, then when we're done, we'll have worked both branches simultaneously, and all we have to do is substitute in i equals 0 to get one branch, and i equals 1 to get the other branch. So we're kind of trying to knock out two pieces of analysis in uh, one fell swoop here by letting i be a variable, and we'll plug in and substitute in when we're done.
So now what we need to do is actually work out what does this integral simplify to, and similarly, what does this integral substitute to? Let's go ahead and do that. So first, let's handle the deterministic part. So for the deterministic part, I'm going to go ahead and let i equal 0, and now I have this integral. That's the same integral we had on the previous page, except I had a wi and a theta i. I've now substituted that in. Let's go ahead and multiply this out. Cosine times cosine from this line to this line, I've just used a trig identity that says that cosine of alpha times cosine of beta is equal to one-half cosine of alpha minus beta plus cosine of alpha plus beta. So this minus this gives me this. This part and this part are common, and phi is the only thing remaining, so the difference results in just phi. When I add them two together, this plus this, it gives me two of everything, except there's only one phi. And then the trig identity has a one-half in it, so the two that was there actually went away. So we end up with this. We are going to write this as actually two integrals, right? I have a cosine times this integrated plus this cosine times this integrated. But the integral of the double frequency terms based on our assumption is zero. So that's why I really have out here plus zero. Then what do I have? So I've taken the cosine phi and I took it outside because it's just a constant. And now I have cosine of phi times the integral of m0 times w0 integrated over all time. So remember what this is. We have a nice shorthand notation. This is just the dot product between the signal m0 of t and w0 of t. <clears throat> so we can write that using our dot product or inner product notation as just parentheses m0 comma w0. That's all it is. So really this is just a notation thing. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to define a new quantity. We're going to define the quantity alpha zero. Alpha zero by definition is the dot product between m0 and w0. And again, this is just a notation thing. It makes it nice for us to, instead of having to write down this integral all the time, we can write it as an inner product. And even easier, instead of writing this inner product, let's call that alpha zero. So we have computed now what u0 is. It is cosine of phi times alpha zero. Let's do the same math now, but let i equal one. So when I let i equal one, I get a w1, and I get a theta one over here, sorry. So a w1 and a theta one. When I integrate this, what happens? Well, this goes back to our assumption. We're assuming that when I have these two things multiplied, that they are orthogonal. Okay, that was one of our starting assumptions and we can reason through why that is a reasonable thing to assume. But based on our starting assumption, this is actually equal to zero. Okay? So under the assumption that signal zero was sent, the deterministic part of the third branch in our receiver, which we're calling U1, is actually zero. All right, so we have handled the deterministic portion of our decision statistic. Now let's handle the random portion of our decision statistic. We need to compute both the expected value and the variance of x of i. So if we go back to that integral equation, we had this was our expression for x of i. So if I want to compute the mean of it, I just need to take the expected value of the whole thing. And we know how to handle that. In this class, we have the rule that we can flip expectation and integration. Can't do it in general, but for the things that we typically assume, it is OK. So once you bring in the e here, you have an e just around x of t. x of t is zero mean additive white Gaussian noise, so it has a mean of zero. So this whole integral just turns into zero as usual. So our noise component has a mean of zero. To compute the variance, now I can just compute the second moment, because when mean is zero, second moment and variance are identical. So that's easy to do. I just need to compute the expected value of this quantity squared. So if I actually do that and simplify all the math, I'm going to get a 2 omega i squared cosine squared. I can use a trig identity and replace the cosine squared, write it as two integrals. I bring in the e, and I let my expectation of x of t times x of s. That turns into the autocorrelation function of white noise. We use the sifting property one time to collapse one of the integrals. 
the same tricks we've done, you know, 10 different times in this class. A lot of the details right here in the math are skipped, but that's something we've done a whole bunch. After you do that, you end up with this expression right here. So what is this expression? Well, this right here is really just the energy of W of I, so we could write it like that. In this case, though, we've chosen to write this using our norm squared notation. So again, this is just a notation thing. Instead of writing the integral, we're going to write the norm squared, and we'll simplify this type of thing later. So we now understand that a deterministic, I'm sorry, the random component of our decision statistic, it's zero mean, almost as always, and its variance has this form.